RCA, ARCA Global Joint Virtual Conference. It's a bit of an awkward situation. Uh, I'm talking to my computer screen. My screen tells me that there are more than 90 currently attending. Uh, the overall number of uh, those who registered is uh, 263. So this is a great success. I hope that everybody can uh, hear me well. And uh, in this session, you can also uh, see the face of Matis Matis Sinovcic, who is uh, the co-president or co-chair of, of uh, this conference, together with me, uh, Holm, and uh, Massimo, who will give uh, the plenary lecture. So, as you know, the uh, planned uh, physical meetings for the SCA in Bonn in April and for ARCA in March in Denver had to be cancelled due to COVID. And things did not improve, as everybody uh, knows, over the summer. So uh, we then decided to replace uh, the physical meetings by a virtual conference that I'm now happy to open. Uh, and um, one advantage, uh, after all, is that the pandemic situation led us to hold a joint conference of uh, SCAR and uh, the ARCA initiative. And in preparation of this conference, uh, we, it became clearer and clearer that there is a significant overlap between both initiatives. Uh, so that we decided not only to have this uh, joint meeting, but to further align both initiatives and to exploit uh, in the future synergies between the SCAR and ARCA global initiative and uh, both fields. Um, I'm, although uh, a, a physical meeting uh, with uh, opportunity to talk to everybody and meet everybody and drink coffee together would have been better, I'm still very optimistic that this uh, virtual format uh, will be a success. Uh, one success, uh, um, at least, is the large number of participants, uh, as you just learned, more than 260. I can tell you if we had organized it as a conventional meeting in Bonn, uh, our lecture hall uh, would have been able to accommodate only 200. So not all of you had uh, been able to participate. Uh, so, and I hope uh, that uh, although we cannot directly talk to each other, this will be a very interactive and a very um, fruitful and effective uh, meeting. Now, Matis, you could move on to the next uh, uh, slide, and uh, I'll start with uh, one slide in which I would like uh, to give an overview um, about uh, the goals and the background of uh, both initiatives and the current situation, uh, in particular with the progress in understanding the molecular genetics and uh, having tools available to directly target RNA and DNA uh, gives cause for, optimistic, uh, for optimism uh, that uh, we will really bring the new therapeutic approaches uh, to the patients and make uh, progress in therapy development. On the other hand, the progress towards trials in the field, and this uh, applies both to the SCARs and the ARCAs, is still hampered by a fragmented research landscape. We have numerous uncoordinated initiatives and projects worldwide in Europe and US, but also Far East Australia. There is no, there are no common standards. Uh, and as a consequence of this, uh, there are missing conditions for data sharing. Next uh, click. Yeah, and the question now arises, what can uh, the SCAR and ARCA Global Initiative do and how can we help with, this, with these initiatives to overcome these obstacles. And our goals are to foster the dialogue between all academic investigators, but in particular between academic investigators and industry. We want to provide a platform for reaching consensus on common standards and uh, we want to act as a catalyst for data sharing and also for joint projects, although we are not a funding organization that uh, is in the 
in a state to really fund uh, joint projects, but we want to catalyze them and motivate people to do joint projects. So what are the future directions? As I already mentioned, uh, there is so much overlap. There will be a lot of synergies, so we will further align the SCAR and AGA global initiatives. Um, I'm very confident that we will reach a consensus among academic partners about standards, in particular of clinical assessment, MRI and uh, biomarker sample, uh, biomaterial sampling. But uh, the next step then will be to reach consensus also with the regulators on outcome markers for um, future trials. And here the CPATH initiative uh, that will be presented in the meeting is of particular importance. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, we want to share data, perform common data analysis, and initiate, it, initiate uh, joint projects. And with this, I would like to hand over to Mattes. And the question we will ask you next is how, is, how do we envision the interaction between SCAR and ARCA Global? And the framework we came up with is as follows. The idea is that we're going to have really common SOPs protocols, common biomarker candidates will arrive, MRI, digital or molecular biomarkers. Clinicians and scientists will ask similar questions to the dominant as well as the recessive detectors. And there might even be the same detector genes which you're focusing on, which might have a recessive or a dominant mode of inheritance. So there's going to be a strong overlap Yet, nevertheless, given this overlap, we're going to have add-on modules for ARCA Global and add-on modules and specifications for SCAR Global. Nevertheless, there's a strong overlap as in terms of those protocols. Those, this overlap on both platforms will be inframed, you see that in blue symbolized, by a joint overall steering committee, by joint communication platforms like Texa Global email lists, and by a joint meeting, that might be one of the first things to, for you to take down. We envision a next meeting, hopefully COVID permitting in 2021. And we envision a two day joint satellite meeting as one of attached to one of the other international ATEXA conferences. Another joint framework will be the joint communication to external partners, for example, to CPATH. And what are going to be the main drivers of ARCA and SCAR Global? What are we going to do and what are you going to do as your work needed? There will be two main driver lines. One is the working groups, the other one are the projects. The working groups are going to um, contribute the tools which we need, like cross-standardized protocols and SOPs, cross-center registries, databases and pipelines, and standardized policies and data sharing, which we can use for our methods and projects to facilitate trial readiness. Those are going to be the working groups and you're going to hear about the working groups from SCAR Global today from ARCA Global on Wednesday. The second driver line will be projects and these will be clinical or scientific projects which leverage SCAR or ARCA Global infrastructure but might run across working groups. So might take outcome measures from the clinical or the molecular biomarkers and combine them. However, importantly, they must be fully geared towards trial readiness. So it's not about like characterization work, but they must be geared to trial readiness. And I'm going to spend one minute on the working groups and one minute on the projects in order to illustrate them more. What are the working groups? The working groups, we will have going to have SCAR Global and ARCA Global working groups, which share again, the same idea, the core protocols. And for the first three working groups, we have um, parallel working groups reflecting each other for SCAR and ARCA Global. These are the following, clinical outcomes and registry, molecular biomarkers and biosampling, MRI biomarkers. The next three working groups so far we just have for ARCA Global, which are next generation sequencing genomics and platforms, digital motor biomarkers, model systems and preclinical trials. However, in the course of this conference, we might want to discuss whether we want to either mirror them to SCAR Global or simply just extend them to SCAR Global. I think that is also something we can discuss on Wednesday. There are three more working groups, which I you want to dub Z working groups, which are as they are cross-cutting. Those are policies and patient organization engagement working group, a novel data sharing working group, which Holm um, found, of course, very important because this is something all of those working groups will have to face. How are we going to share data and the young investigator initiatives? 
And again, you see those working groups today and on Wednesday. And please feel free to sign up for those working groups. So that's driver line number one, doing the work. Driver line number two are the actual scientific or clinical projects. And here you see a rather busy table of the projects which have been proposed so far for ARCA Global, you see them on the top, or SCAR Global, you see the one on the bottom. We have an ARCA Global, we have called for those projects prior to the pre-planned Denver conference in January. And that is why there's so quite a number of ARCA projects already up there, like RFC1, the Natural History Study, RFC1 Imaging Study, SPG7, RZAX, Tried Readiness Study, a speech study, a genome study, stem cell studies, and one biomarker study or a functional study in recessive Texas. And there was one very recent but very promising approach, a project proposal by Alexandre Dürr on conventional scars, genotype, phenotype studies. And that's a very good paradigmatic, paradigmatic project for SCAR Global. And those are first projects. I want, don't want it want to discuss in detail here. This is just an, are just examples on how the project lines are going to move forward. And if you want to propose a project for ARCA or SCAR Global, the next steps are as follows. We're going to circulate a project template and please submit this project template back to us, to Emily Cutting until November 1st. Those projects will be checked and coordinated by the Texa Global Steering Committee. And they will be checked in particular for trial readiness. And then we're going to have a second conference specifically dedicated to discussing those projects, which I've just shown you the table and the new ones, which you're going to propose in detail in December for a half or a full day, and then we'll coordinate them. And what is the ultimate goal of that? The ultimate goal is to decide which projects should be endorsed by the Texa Global platforms. This means which projects should receive full infrastructure support in terms of the contact lists, the standards, the SOPs, the discussion platforms, which you are now seeing for SCAR and ARCA Global. So just keep in mind, ARTA, as Thomas had just said, the techs are global platforms. They are not funding agencies. They are trial readiness platforms and accelerators. And they help you to accelerate your trial readiness project. So complete the project template, and then we discuss it at the conference in December. So how can you now participate in the conference? And we want, nevertheless, this is a virtual conference. We want this to be really interactive. It all depends on your contributions. And how can you participate? First of all, if you have questions to the presenters, feel free to enter them at any time in the Q&A box, which you see at the bottom control panel of your Zoom mod, um, account. And in this Q&A account, you can just um, like or upgrade the question or comment by the others, and then they will go up in the ranking list. If you have a message which you would not, would not, would not like to present to, um, send to the presenters, but to all panelists or to panelists and all attendees, use the chat box. Then we are going to have virtual coffee rooms in the agenda, and there's actually time to talk, not just to type. So you're free to use your microphone and to talk with all the speakers and attendees and to ask your questions to discuss proposals. We're going to have polls, and we're going to test that in a minute, where we repeatedly ask you for your opinion. For the speakers, please have in mind that we have a busy agenda. So have your talks ready and don't search for your talks, your PowerPoint files, have them ready to be shared once your time slot. For all attendees, sessions will be recorded and you will be sent a link after the event where you can just look at the sessions again, so you will have access to all the recordings of the sessions. And finally, if your internet breaks down, if you have to you take a break or whatsoever, feel free to do so and just use the Zoom personal link, which Berta has sent to you earlier, and you can always use this to go back in. So it's time to try the polls. And we have four poll questions to you. And please just type, tip in, which of the world do you work in, what time, just go through it. We just check whether it's working. And whether you are awake. And in order to check whether you're quick, we give you 10 more seconds. And let's see, can we get the result, Cornelia and Beata already? Perfect. So it's pretty European. I mean, that is probably a problem of the time slots. But even though it's early in the US, thanks for joining us from North America. Thanks for joining from South America. We really appreciate that it's early in the morning. Um, thanks to you guys. Um, 
So where you're hiding many from home, I think that's very convenient if you can do it from home. And quite a substantial share of junior investigators and students. And I think that is excellent also for the Young Investigator Initiative by, by Heike and Jennifer later on. So welcome everybody um, and thanks for joining the poll. Before closing, I would like to thank our Platinum sponsors. I would like to thank our Gold sponsors. And I would like to thank our Silver sponsors. And I would like to um, just highlight that you can follow It Takes a Global um, on tweet and just use the conference hashtag It Takes a Global 2020. And then finally, I want to give the biggest thank, the mega platinum thanks to Birte and Holm. And Birte told me this morning that she likes dark chocolate. And I think one of my and Thomas' jobs is to get some dark chocolate over to Birte. However, while we're doing to do planning to do so, um, we would like to give the next word to Massimo and maybe Thomas, you can um, hand over to, talk to, to Massimo. Thank you. Thomas, you're muted still. Now it's my great pleasure and honor to introduce our keynote speaker, Massimo Pandolfo. I don't believe that's really necessary to introduce him because everybody knows him in the field. Nevertheless, I would very briefly say something about uh, Massimo. Um, he is a neurologist, but a true translational uh, neurologist. Uh, he led the team that um, discovered uh, the mutation causing Friedreich's ataxia and uh, the new gene, uh, the flotexin gene in, uh, gene in 1996. And since then, uh, he contributed a lot to the understanding of the gene function and of the disease mechanism. But uh, from that time on, he was also interested in translating this into new treatments and into new trials and, and to prepare the trial readiness in the free drug uh, field. And in the free drug field, there have been a number of trials, unfortunately so far not entirely successful, but uh, they are a bit ahead uh, of uh, the development in the SCAR and ARCA field. So uh, I'm convinced that we can learn a lot uh, from the free drug uh, field. Uh, and this is uh, also the topic of his uh, talk towards trial equivalent natural history studies in SCARS and ARCAS standards and criteria for trial readiness. Massimo, it's a pleasure uh, to have you in the virtual conference and uh, please start with your presentation. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much, Thomas, and thank you very much for the whole group uh, to having invited me to give this uh, this keynote uh, presentation. It's really a honor. It comes almost nine months after that traumatic morning when I was already I had already my suitcase ready and my boarding pass, and then I learned that the that the Denver meeting was canceled. Uh, I think it's been a, it's been a great effort to. to nevertheless uh, put together this on uh, this virtual conference and it looks like uh, just by the participation level that this is going to be a great success so you know i'm, I'm doubly honored of being here i added a, a small subtitle to the title that was proposed that, that is what we can learn from from the frida katax experience because that's what i can bring to you to this group and uh, I am sure I will speak about a fade, therefore, mostly, uh, but I tried to uh, kind of tailor my presentation in such a way that the message will be a common message for, uh, for all the uh, ataxia, uh, for, for all the ataxia world. Um, I am starting with the conclusion and we will get back to the conclusion. Uh, basically, clinical outcomes utilized as clinical trial endpoint should reflect an improvement of our patient fields or functions. Now, this seems trivial. This seems a tautology. Of course, if you want to treat a disease, if you want to treat uh, uh, you, uh, what you do, you try to make the, pa the patient feel better or function better. But why we all agree on this and why there is in insistence 
uh, on the part of, of course, the patients and patient association at this point, and on the other hand, insistence uh, on the part of regulatory agencies on this point, we will see that uh, it's not so obvious then how to, uh, to put this in practice, actually, and to use the data that we have from the natural history studies that are being conducted in a number of ataxias that are planned in a number of ataxias and make them actually outcome and, and, and you know, define these outcomes that have, uh, that have clinical value. Now, just, uh, just uh, as an introduction, as you know, there are different types of clinical outcome assessments uh, that can be done by a clinician directly, by a patient, by a non-clinician observer, or through a performance-based assessment. So we, just, we usually recognize patient-reported outcomes, cl clinical reported, clinician-reported outcomes, observer-reported outcomes, performance outcomes. And uh, all this actually, have, uh, have a role and can be uh, can contribute to, to define the endpoints of a clinical of a clinical trial. Uh, however, he, in in uh, uh, in uh, I'm sorry in this uh, in my presentation I will essentially focus on the clinician reported outcomes on some function outcomes and I will say a few words about patient reported outcomes. What I will not talk about are uh, uh, biomarkers, are uh, MRI markers, biofluid markers, digital biomarkers, all these things I think will be um, dealt with uh, by other speakers uh, throughout uh, this meeting and uh, would make my talk go well beyond the, uh, the planned half hour. Just let me start uh, with a general concept. Uh, I think uh, the, 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 uh, the regulatory agencies, uh, consider very important that a clinical outcome assessment uh, is fit for purpose. So what does that mean? It means that it that it's used to describe how the intervention is going to be used, but particularly what we uh, what is the purpose of this intervention, and therefore it has to uh, it has to be a a, a, a measure that is patient centered that assesses what's important to patients and what is clinically relevant, must have content validity. That is, it has to uh, assess the target concept according to patient population and study design. And of course, it has to be a measure that is sensitive to change. Otherwise, it may fail to detect the effect of a treatment, uh, particularly in the case of a slowly progressive chronic disease, like is the case for uh, most of the uh, inherited ataxias. Now, uh, I said that my, the, the main goal of my, of my presentation is actually to uh, make some general points about how to move from observation to intervention. That is, how to uh, generate, starting from uh, uh, the wealth of natural history data that has been collected by a number of major collaborative prospective studies that are already ongoing and some, and some that, are, that are being planned, how can we use this data to define the fit for purpose uh, clinical outcome assessment for clinical trials? And again, I will use the uh, experience of Frida Cataxia Field and particular one of these studies, which is the EFAX clinical studies. EFAX is the European consortium for uh, the European Frida Cataxia Consortium for Translational Studies. Uh, this uh, is an international collaboration that at the beginning included clinical and basic science sites uh, with the goal actually of, on the one hand, of collecting uh, information to, for, to design trials for, for, for FA, but also to set up an infrastructure that could perform this trial. And of course, uh, to, uh, to favor interaction between basic scientists working on the basic concept that should lead to treatments and the clinician that they should apply those treatments. Um, we, uh, the clinical study is still ongoing after uh, about 10 years now, uh, and it has a number of clinical outcome assessment that you can see summarized in this, uh, in this slide. And uh, uh, we will see how uh, this, uh, this repertory, if you wish, of COAs has 
uh, turned out to, to function in practice in these clinical studies and what is the perspective of using this COAs or some of the COAs or an adaptation of the COAs for, uh, for clinical trials. And again, we have to ask the question whether these are patient-centered, if they are content validity, and if they are sensitive to change. And now most of the data that we have concern the last point, that is the sensitivity to change. But I think we have also some, uh, some orienting information about the other essential points. Now, in the, the, main, the main outcome measure that is used in EFAX is the scale for the assessment and rating of ataxia, called SARA. Uh, and this turned out to, to be uh, the uh, outcome assessment that was most sensitive to progression. So it's basically a just a standardized neurozem, a rating scale. And in fact, uh, the fact that the SARA was the most sensitive to progression is being shown in the cross-section and in the two-year uh, follow-up data that have been published and it's just being confirmed in additional follow-up data that have not yet been published. Sarah, for those who are not, uh, uh, I assume every, almost everybody here is, is familiar with it, but it's an 80-item clinical rating scale that was developed for the Euroscar project, but it's now been applied to uh, many different types of ataxia, so uh, dominant and recessive, as a total maximum score of 40, indicating maximum disability. And in EFAX, we have up to nine years prospective data available from hundreds of, well, nine years, not from hundreds of patients, but we have uh, four years at least from uh, several hundred patients. And uh, we can see that the progression uh, calculated is about 0 0.75 uh, points per year. And SRM is basically the ratio between the uh, change and its standard deviation, as you can see is 0.55. It's not extraordinary, it means that still the standard deviation is larger than the change, uh, which of course makes this measure less powerful than uh, the smaller this number is, the, the less powerful the, the measure is in terms of providing a, a robust outcome sensitive to change for, for a clinical study. Already by the analysis, from the analysis of the overall data set, it was clear that the progression was faster in patients with younger age of onset and that was lowering patients with a long history of disease duration and of and it was and it was faster in those patients who started uh, from a lower score which means that they were essentially at the beginning of their uh, of their disease history uh, now this uh, uh, why this is relevant information, and we'll get back to it uh, with a more detailed analysis, because this is helping us to um, kind of focus better uh, how we can use this tool and make it uh, the most possible sensitive to change, um, which is an important point for a fit for, for purpose uh, uh, clinical uh, assessment, clinical outcome assessment. And uh, here you can see uh, some more detailed data about uh, those statements. So these are data on uh, uh, just the Brussels court. So about a little more than 50 patients that have been, that have been followed at my site, in which uh, you can see plotted the, the SARA score versus the disease duration in three age of onset groups. And as you can see, uh, these are significantly different. This is a significant difference statistically, as you can imagine, and this also means that they are clinically, of course, significantly different. And you can see how steep is the increase in those who had onset before age eight. It's a sort of intermediate between age eight and 14, and becomes a much uh, less steep in the uh, age of onset after 15. What is this telling us? It's telling us that if you wanted to focus on, uh, on a patient group that has that has uh, the fastest progression and the, and therefore on the on both the the uh, the highest possibility of giving us a signal of benefit and the most sensitive to change and also probably the, the patient group that most needs a treatment that's the young onset now uh, it is possible that this doesn't apply to all cases, but it's very clear that this applies also to a number of other conditions, particularly the ARCA field. Uh, 
I, I mentioned the effect of the disease stage. And what we can see uh, is that in fact, after about 24 years of, of, of progression, there is a sort of a break in the, in, in the line indicating, uh, indicating the worsening of the SARA score. Uh, it becomes slower. It becomes slower for a number of reasons. One is of course uh, that the disease may become, uh, may also probably evolve more slowly after a number of years. But of course, uh, there are some psychometric, uh, uh, you know, characteristics of the scale that also can can uh, be responsible for this that indicate a specific need. This, the need for better tools to assess uh, uh, progression and uh, so better clinical outcome assessments for those advanced cases. And on the uh, on the right hand side, just to make this clear, I am plotted, you, see, you can see plotted the uh, scores for specific items versus the total score. And as you can see, there are some items, gate and stands, that essentially drive the uh, progression up until uh, up until a score of around uh, between 20 or around 25, I would say on average, 25, 26. And as you can see, this corresponds essentially to that steeper first part of the, uh, of the line on the right-hand panel, the one that corresponds to less than 25 years of disease duration in most patients. Um, this, the other, other tests like the heel to sheen slide and the seating show it is slightly different uh, type of progression. But what you can see that evolves in this later stage of the disease is essentially the items that have to do with upper limb coordination and speech. And this is also shown if you compare a standardized functional test with the SARA. And again, you can see that there's a sort of a sigmoid, which is called the CACFS. Um, it's a standardized test of dexterity with the upper limb, essentially, uh, considered to be a test of cerebellar function. And as you can see, again, there is an acceleration after the, uh, I don't know if you can see my cursor, it is an, an acceleration after loss of the ambulation, meaning, that essentially the SARA uh, is good in assessing progression as long as it's due to uh, problems with gait and balance, but it's less good, at least in this patient group, when uh, it rapidly goes to upper, to, the, to, to, to basically to its ceiling uh, when uh, in the later stages of, of development, which means it indicates the need for additional and better tailored to tools for this phase of the disease. Uh, one thing that I, that I like to mention is the fact that, that we cannot predict the, uh, the uh, speed of change in a single patient just by looking at how big the change was in the previous year. Actually, that corresponds more to noise than to uh, real differences in disease progression. And like all noise, it tends to, uh, to converge toward the mean. And therefore, if anything, the change in SARA during, during uh, the following year is negatively correlated with change in the previous year. This, of course, that's not the case if the change is averaged over three or four, at least the data points, in which case it becomes predictive. And it's also an, a way of selecting more sensitive uh, to change uh, uh, patient populations. Now, why we have this problem with advanced disease? Well, we have to keep in mind that, that the progression of motor impairment in Friedreich's ataxia, and the case may be the same and actually is the same for a number of other ataxias, is that the uh, underlying pathophysiology may change over, over time. At the beginning, uh, patients with FA have a component of afferent ataxia, but they be actually become symptomatic when cerebellar symptoms appear, including dysarthria. And then uh, ataxia and dysarthria uh, keep worsening after uh, gait ataxia leads to, leads to loss of ambulation. So this, this happens throughout the, uh, the course of the disease. But in the late stage, there are other components, in particular pyramidal weakness in this case, that progresses mostly after loss of ambulation. And this also comes out from the analysis of the effects data. 
uh, even though some pyramidal signs are present in early disease as well, what, what really interferes with function, like makes it slow and difficult to, just a difficult to perform a number, a number of items that therefore jump directly to the highest score is actually pyramidal weakness, which is of course uh, one of the reasons why the scale that has been tailored on cerebellar signs may not work at this point. We actually uh, collect the data on non-ataxia signs and including, including weakness, amyotrophy, et cetera. Uh, but the progression of, uh, we, we use the, what is called the INAS count, which is 30 items grouped into 16 binary variables, yes or no, and you count how many yes you have. Uh, there are other ways of, of, of assessing this in, in FA, but we see that the sensitivity uh, to progression of this is really limited, particularly in patients who had earlier disease onset that basically already accumulate a number of these signs and their progression is difficult to, to uh, there's no additional signs that, that appear, it's just that, that those that are present before become worse, but this is not what this count is made for uh, to, to assess, it's just the number of signs. So. This really doesn't work in this case. Uh, before we move to other types of assessment, I just want to mention the issue of power calculations. So I said that uh, we had with the EFAX experience one rating scale that seems to be the most sensitive uh, to progression. At least uh, we have identified what groups of patients are most sensitive in terms of early end onset and being still ambulatory, essentially. Uh, we, we mentioned the need for uh, better tools uh, for the most advanced the patients. Um, of course, uh, we want to see how, what is the power of that tool, how we needed to design a trial in order to have chances to detect the change. And uh, this is, of course, a big problem because in rare diseases, patients uh, that can be enrolled in a trial are few and dispersed. And particularly when there are competing trials in, in the FA field, this is the case. Uh, we will see there are already competing trials and there will be more in the coming years. We, we have a problem with just getting enough patients to have, to have a signal. So there is, of course, uh, what I just mentioned, we can select patients for those that, that, that are more likely to give an efficacy signal. Uh, but of course, this may even further reduce the number of eligible patients and make it recruitment uh, harder. And also we have to consider that eventually a treatment might be, be tested in all patients affected by the disease because all uh, may benefit and that we, we have the duty of, of, of checking whether, whether that's the case. So we can of course use a number of different trial designs, a particular adaptive designs that can provide some flexibility in a pre-planned manner and therefore adapt, for instance, the different groups of patients uh, uh, while the trial is already ongoing. I'm just now like to mention one thing, one, one, one thing that can give us a general guide, but it's probably not that reliable, are power calculation based on natural history studies by themselves. And I think we have an example in the FA field with a re recent clinical trial called the MOXIE using a molecule called omebalaxolone. This trial is the first one that was clearly positive. And this is, uh, this is uh, a graph that was released by uh, in, a, in, a, in a press release uh, just after uh, this trial. And you can see that you have uh, the treated patients that are clearly that in, 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 in orange that are clearly diverging from the placebo treated patients. Uh, and this difference, although they did not provide at this stage any error bars, it was clearly statistically significant. And you can see in gray what would have been based on just on the natural history data from, from uh, uh, the um, US uh, uh, FACOM score to, from which most of these patients came, uh, would have been the, uh, and you can see that there is a clear difference of both the placebo group and the treated group from this line. So just the planning a divergence from this line probably would not, would not be that effective in, in determining, uh, in, in, in making power calculation. And there are a number of reasons for this. The placebo effect itself that affects both the active drug and, uh, drug and the placebo group. 
The fact that, that in a clinical trial context, uh, the patients have a closer follow-up, they are more motivated, they are probably uh, more engaged in other activities so that can improve their function. The fact that, that an effective treatment may reduce the noisiness of the measure, so that actually, if a treatment really is acting on the, on, on the disease, you may have uh, less uh, variability from measure to measure. Of course, you collect more data points, and these are collected in probably more homogeneous testing conditions under the strict protocol of a clinical trial, particularly when a different assessment to do in the same day, and you place this assessment in a well-defined uh, uh, well uh, uh, succession. So reality actually may be better than expected, as, as the uh, MOXIE trial has shown. Let me move to the last part of my presentation that has to do with clinical benefit. The clinical benefit is the main point. It's defined as a positive effect of an intervention of how an individual feels, functions, or survives. And so we have to, make, to, to now translate all these numbers, changes in clinical rating scale. What do they mean for the patient? Do they provide a clinical benefit? Because this makes, of course, these changes clinically meaningful. And, uh, and, uh, and, and that makes uh, a, 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 an assessment to use a primary endpoint, uh, something of significance to patients. Of course, uh, to understand what's clinically meaningful, we have first to listen to patients because they're the best expert in their disease. They know what good and bad they can expect from existing and new treatments and they can indicate what's important for them. That may not be obvious sometimes uh, from the point of view of researchers, developers, and, and even regulators. And so this includes a number of abilities to function in everyday life, uh, and not really things that, have been, that can be detected in a neuro exam that are important uh, markers of physiopathology, but that are probably not uh, by themselves of relevance to the patient. I think loss of ambulation is a major milestone in Friedrichs and in other ataxias. And one of the things that we can look at is actually to consider the reaching of these milestones. And uh, of course, we can select the patients who are at risk of reaching this milestone in a relatively short time frame uh, by looking at other parameters. And there have been studies on the American court, on FACOMS, looking at predictors of loss of ambulation in our European court, essentially, it's clear that when patients uh, uh, need the su constant support for walking, and they will probably be in a wheelchair within, within two years, and these patients may be selected for what looks like a really clinically significant outcome measure. And again, this will be reached much earlier in patients with early onset than with later onset. So again, focusing on patients with early onset, at least in early clinical trials, may be a way of increasing power. We looked at other look looked at other things like functional in, uh, tests, and unfortunately, I will be very fast about this. They really didn't work as uh, sensitive to progression uh, scores, even though they may reflect actually abilities and function in everyday life. And we have considered also abilities and function in everyday life also depend from a number of other neurological impairment, and not necessarily the motor impairment that is mostly. Uh, uh, evaluated by this by this uh, approaches. Uh, you can of course uh, use a number of assessment of non-motor impairment, but the one that seems to be working best in the FA field, and I think would work well also in other fields, is actually a, a standardized assessment of activities of daily living. We use this one that was developed with the uh, uh, with the FARS rating scale. We know that it tightly correlates with the SARA score. Uh, we have an R square of 0.8 or so. And not only because some items are the same, but because some items are very similar concerning ability to walk, for instance. Some items are quite different and specific to the activities of daily living score. And anyway, they are seen from a different perspective. So this correlation is important. Uh, but uh, uh, it's, uh, it doesn't mean that the, the two measures are redundant. And in fact, uh, in the overall EFACS, uh, the ADL score showed an excellent sensitivity to, to progression, which was even 
slightly better at two years than, than the SAR. And again, if we divide patients according to age of onset, we find that the same thing, that this score is also particularly uh, fast uh, to progress uh, in patients with younger onset and uh, less advanced the disease. I think uh, somebody else will be gonna speak about the digital health technologies that, that can allow uh, a detailed analysis of functionally meaningful movements in a clinical setting at distance uh, in everyday, everyday settings. And of course, uh, there are still issues about how to develop this, this approaches. And I think you will see um, all these issues discussed by other talks later today. Uh, I will end up by mentioning the patient reported outcomes. You will, uh, there are also talks about patient reported outcomes in, in, in ataxias uh, that you will hear at this meeting. Uh, there have been a number of these uh, that have been tested in, uh, in, in the FA field. Unfortunately, uh, the general quality of life measures are scarcely sensitive to FA progression, uh, but maybe a response to stabilization of clinical improvement may be expected. Uh, we in Europe use essentially this measure included in the EFAX assessment protocol, but again, its sensitivity to progression in such a slowly progressive disease is very limited and probably only a strongly effective treatment would, would, would determine a change. And the same is for other measures. Uh, I will mention the Friedrich Ataxia Impact Scale, which is a recently developed uh, uh, tool for, uh, as a patient re reported outcome that considers symptoms, physical functioning, psychological and social impact. Uh, it has a good correlation with clinical rating scales, but again, a positive change is probably likely if the patient has a meaningful uh, clinical benefit. So I will end up uh, with the conclusion with which I started. Uh, clinical outcomes utilized as a clinical trial endpoint should reflect an improvement on our patient fields of function. And it's, our, and it's not so easy and trivial to uh, convert the numbers from rating scales, from what seems to work, from what seems to be sensitive to progression into, uh, into something that tells us how a patient feels on function. And on the other hand, things that, that seem to be designed from the beginning uh, to tell us how a patient feels of function sometimes are not so good in detecting change unless a real major change occurs, which we all hope will be the case with new treatments, but you know, it's not, but even a, a smaller change could be, could be beneficial and we need to find uh, effective ways of showing the impact of even smaller change that can in the long run be important. Uh, okay, I think I wish to thank you all for your attention and I hear I'm also thanking all the uh, public uh, organization and the associations and industry that supported our work. And thank you very much. Well, hey, uh, <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not sure great, that I... <laughs> uh, for this uh, great uh, talk um, and you're perfectly in time. Uh, there's a lot of chat uh, going on, but uh, so far uh, no a question. So if you have questions to Massimo, I can read them and Matis can read them and we can then forward them to Massimo. So I will, um, uh, we have a few minutes for discussion, uh, um, start with a discussion with a few comments. Uh, one very important finding uh, or analysis that you did was the comparison between the uh, uh, progression in the previous year and uh, the next year um, and um, this is uh, for me this is a very important uh, finding because I learned from discussions uh, with a number of industry companies that they are thinking of trials which they try to select uh, participants who had a very fast uh, degree and to include those into the trials because there's the hope that uh, they are more sensitive uh, to the um, to the change and uh, they can detect changes um, in, in those with a faster progression. But this is a uh, risk because this, what you were describing, there's the well-known uh, phenomenon regression to the mean. Those who were fast in one year may be 
uh, then uh, slower in the next year. So this, for me, this does not appear to be a very good strategy for selection for trials. Then a second uh, comment, but I see there are now questions. So I will move to the question. Um, I just have to go to them. Um, short. Yeah. Um, maybe I, I'd select the question of, of T. Ashizawa. What is the best strategy to reduce the standard deviation in your gut feeling? Uh, so, uh, if you're talking about the clinical rating scales, um, and, and, and actually, I just wanted to, you know, again, insist on that point. Uh, uh, the fact that if you look at just at the previous year, you get regression to the mean that will vanify your effort. But if you look like, for instance, at four years for the patients that have long enough follow up, then you can average year after year, and then you get, you get valuable information in terms of, of identifying patients who are faster progressing. Otherwise, I think the general features uh, like you know, being in, in, in a certain stage of the disease, which means ambulatory for FA and having a, a earlier onset is probably uh, the best way of selecting fast progressing patients. Basically, now moving, uh, move, uh, moving maybe to, to, to the uh, question, I think uh, you have to do uh, regularly, you know, first of all, you need, you need to do more than one test every uh, year like is done in, in natural history studies. But this is, of course, in all, uh, in all, uh, in all clinical trial protocols, you have, you have more closely spaced tests. I think the other point is the standardization of the protocol, which means you have the day of the patient when the patient comes for, for assessment of the clinical trial must be very, uh, accurately planned so that, for instance, all patients will have their uh, clinical rating scale at one point of the day when they have done certain things and before they die, do other things. Um, it's, it's hard to, to you know, make sure that the patients uh, are not just coming from the airport when you test them so that if they have to come from far away, they come at least one day earlier. I mean, obvious things. Other than that, I'm afraid that uh, the most uh, important factor to decrease the standard deviation is an effective treatment. And we cannot, <laughs> you know, we hope we had one when we started the trial, but uh, I'm convinced that an effective treatment in the treated group would, would really uh, reduce variability. Yeah, thank you for, for this answer. I, what I can add is our experience from the SARA home recordings where we uh, see that there is enormous variation of the SARA from day to day. So the variation that we see in the natural history may partly uh, derive from this natural uh, fluctuation of ataxia in, in patients. So this is a normal phenomenon in these uh, people. Uh, unfortunately, time is running. Um, I, I just select one additional question with uh, asking you to, to give a short answer. Uh, it comes from Laura. Hello, Laura. Uh, Jardim. Brazil. Uh, could you, if we are now in the COVID situation uh, where uh, site visits may be difficult, could you uh, imagine that an ADL questionnaire can, uh, which can be completed at home can be a uh, supplement uh, for a, or even replace a SARA rating uh, at the hospital? I think, I think that's a possibility in, 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 in special situations like this. Uh, I would recommend that the ADL uh, questionnaire is filled up uh, uh, in a directed manner, which means not just given to the patient to, to fill up, but that the, uh, the investigator questions of the patient and uh, and the caregivers so it can be done at home via even a phone call but it, but i think it has to be done that way and not just by having the patient feeling 